Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of So You Want to Lead a Party? Uh, I'm Nate. I'm Reagan. Uh, thank you so much for checking out this episode. And um, please don't forget to click like, subscribe, and leave a comment on our YouTube channel. Oh, Nefertiti. Nefertiti was born circa 1370 and uh, died circa 1330 BCE. Uh, Nefertiti and her husband were known for a religious revolution in which they worshiped one god only, Anton, or the sun disk. This brought about a lot of changes in religion and politics. Uh, with her husband, she reigned at what was arguably the wealthiest period of ancient Egyptian history. Some scholars believe that Nefertiti ruled briefly as, and I apologize if I mispronounce this, Neferin Neferin Ten, after her husband's death, before the ascension of Tutankhamun. Again, I apologize if I mispronounce that. But there's a bit of a debate about if that were true or not. Her parentage is debated with some believing that she was foreign born and others believing that she was the daughter of Ai, who became Pharaoh after the death of King Tut. She came to popular knowledge due to the bust of her that was discovered in 1913. So I, I don't know what, what you think, but uh, this seems to be another one of those situations where you have a female ruler like Cleopatra, like Elizabeth I, like Queen Mary, where there is truth and then there is fiction. And it's difficult to see where the truth and the fiction uh, have to come apart. For sure. There's a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot of potentially contradictory, but the contradictory in some ways and complementary in other ways, information and accounts. Uh, there's frankly just a lot we don't know about that period in general, it sounds like. It seems like scholars are doing, are kind of doing their best, um, but it's also, there's also an inescapable sense that with a female ruler, uh, particularly uh, one that was apparently possibly as powerful and charismatic, as Nefertiti was, um, is, is difficult, as you say, to separate facts from fiction. Yeah, and it also sounds like when her bus was discovered in 1913, the reason why people became interested was because in, in how lovely it was. Mm -hmm. And this, again, feels like uh, another example of women are not considered valuable unless they are attractive yes. and unless they are mothers and it's this viewpoint of women that they have to uh they qualify for importance once they match the male gaze mm -hmm. and that's one of those things where it's like okay come on <laughs> i mean i get it it's 1913 People haven't learned what they have learned today, but it still is something that feels like it holds true. If you are not qualified to hold the male gaze, then you are basically someone that we should put on an ice uh, cap and then float off to sea. Or a pedestal and think that like they're impossibly beautiful and, they, and they're so beautiful that they're not serious rulers. Right. That's another. That's another. Uh, that's another. Yet another way in which the patriarchy traps female rulers. Right. It's a like, trap. It's, it's a trap. <laughs> it is. It's a friggin' trap. It, it really. It really very much is a trap because you you do you you see that all the time. She's too pretty to be taken seriously as a medical professional. Uh, I remember. I had surgery, what was it, like two or three years ago. And my anesthesiologist, I remember thinking as she was putting me out, like, holy crap, this woman is absolutely gorgeous. And I started thinking, wow, that just had to be tough 
in school and then at work being taken seriously, not just by your male coworkers, but also by your female coworkers, mm -hmm. because it, it has permeated the female mindset where we'll even say she's too pretty to take seriously or she's, she's unattractive. So she must be funny or, or nerdy or something like this. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 it's, it's really bad. It's really bad. <laughs> it's, it's really, really bad. bad. <laughs> All right. So let's get into our build. Okay. So my build for Queen Nefertiti is as follows. Um, I decided to make her a Tabaxi warlock of the Celestial Pact. And uh, I did that for a couple of reasons. One, cats, stereotypically, but also factually, uh, were quite sacred to the Egyptians. Um, I initially went with uh, I initially went with an elven light cleric, but I decided to make it a little bit make it a little bit spicier. Uh, so a Tabaxi uh, cat person warlock of the Celestial Pact. Uh, Primarily because with warlocks, their spellcasting is powered by charisma. Cult leaders run on charisma, uh, and charisma skills are a very, in my opinion, important part of playing D&D. Persuading someone to do something, intimidating someone in, uh, out of fighting you, um, performance, deceiving someone if you're trying to hide information from them. Uh, the higher your charisma is, the better you can be at those. And it can be very fun role play with the party. Um, she's got some divine influence. She might not be entirely moral. I think that's an interesting role play angle as well. Uh, for her background, I decided to make her, since she was a queen, I decided to give her the courtier background uh, as an insightful royal manipulator, leader of a theocratic, death obsessed, very rich empire with a drive to gather more followers for her and her husband's sun god, uh, the sun disc Aten. Ability scores. She um, uh, obviously needs to have high charisma. Uh, as a level twenty sorcerer, she a uh, level twenty warlock. Excuse me. Um, that's a lot of time to be able to build that charisma up. Uh, so I also get a bonus to charisma from being at the boxy. Uh, so she's got twenty charisma, twenty dexterity, eighteen constitution. 14 Wisdom, 11 Intelligence, and 8 Strength. She's not going to be lifting things, she's going to be ordering you to lift things and, con and convincing you that it was a very good time. Uh, in terms of initiative, uh, she's going to be going probably decently high in the order when combat swings in, or when combat comes around, uh, she's got a plus 5 to her initiative roll. Uh, in terms of armor class, uh, I equipped her with studded leather armor, which offers a base AC of 12 plus your dexterity modifier. So 12 plus 5 is 17. Uh, five spells I decided to give her among the, among the many that I was able to, because she's a level 20 character, she gets a lot of spells. Uh, among the many that uh, I thought were very fun, including uh, were kind of control oriented with some light and slightly sinister on top of that. Uh, Sickening Radiance is an area of effect spell that grants some damage but also imposes exhaustion, which makes it harder for your enemies to do things. Shadow of Moil could be potentially very useful turning invisibility into a weapon. Uh, Force Cage, a 
essentially a magic uh, box cage that you can drop over something. So imagine, if you will, a big enough enemy. You cast Sickening Radiance at that enemy and drop a fourth cage on top of it. They can only use magic to escape. If they have, if it's a, if it's a big strong melee monster and no ability to cast spells, you are playing, uh, you are watching back and you are sitting back and enjoying the show as Sickening Radiance takes it down. Um, being a warlock, she also, uh, she doesn't have very many spell slots. She also doesn't have very many spells known, but she does get a couple of extra things. A boon from her patron, a sun god, uh, in this case, a tome, a book of ancient secrets, uh, and uh, the ability to invoke extra powers with certain limitations and abilities at certain uh, at certain time intervals. The warlock invoca invocation mechanic is very interesting. Uh, with the Book of Ancient Secrets invocation, she gets three extra cantrips and uh, the ability to cast ritual spells by copying them down into her book. I would imagine they would be something uh, akin to a roll of de like a magical Rolodex of her cult that also includes the names of her cult members. Uh, then one of my very favorite spells is Foresight. With an eight hour duration, casting that on some, it is a ninth level spell, casting that on someone will essentially allow them to laugh their way through several different, potentially very difficult encounters. Uh, every attack is on them is made, uh, is made with disadvantage. Practically every saving throw and attack they make is with advantage. Uh, that is a very powerful buff, if you will. Uh, I think that she is uh, very well positioned to be a blaster, a controller, and a support caster, just right for a charismatic queen and sun god acolyte. That is, uh, that is my build for Nefertiti. This is my Nefertiti build. For her race, I made her a changeling, and we'll get into that in a little bit uh, regarding my reasons. Uh, for her class, I decided to go with a light cleric. Uh, that goes back to Nefertiti and her husband being the ones who brought the people to a uh, monotheistic religion where they focused in on uh, the sun disc Anton. It's believed that she became a pharaoh after her husband and would wear a beard and took on a new per persona, so that's going back to the changeling. Uh, the actions that she and the pharaoh took were all in honor of their god. They worship the god, they moved the capital to a new location, so everything was in relationship to that monotheistic religion. Her wisdom is a 20, her charisma is a 17, dexterity 16, constitution 14, intelligence 8, and strength 8. Wisdom, because the power of the cleric is coming from that wisdom, they learn their spells. Charisma, going back to her changeling, uh, race. So I push those particularly hard. After that, you want your dexterity to be high because of that dexterity modifier. Uh, intelligence, you don't need to worry that much about, as well as strength, because she's going to be relying on those spells. So then the next thing to move up is constitution. Her initiative is a plus three. Her armor class is a 17. She has a shield, a mace, and studded leather. Her strength is low, so we need to use a light armor with a shield to get that armor class up. Studded leather gives you a uh, 12, and so that shield gives you an additional uh, points there, plus the initiative. So the shield gives you a, a plus two with that for that armor class. 
The spells that I focused in on were Summon Celestial, Spirit Guardian, Mass Heal, Holy Aura, and Anti-Magic Field. Summon Celestial, again, because she was um, a queen, and so the sun god, she would be summoning uh, Anten. Mass Heal is an amazing one, because you can heal members of your party and add in you have like a plus 700 uh hit points that you can dole out amongst your entire party so that is a very powerful spell to have spirit guardian you want to be able to call on um a guardian to help you as you are in your battle. Uh, Holy Aura, going back to um, Nefertiti and her relationship with the sun disc Anton. And that anti-magic field, well, being as she is the ruler, she should technically be the only one with that power. So she's going to be able to use that spell so that no one else that's coming after her or her party can use any form of magic. I'm going to be completely honest with you on this one. Uh, I looked at your build before creating my build. Uh-huh. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm kind of curious if I had not looked at your build or peeked at your build, uh, how close we would have been to, to the same. Uh, but wow. yeah, but you choosing Warlock, me choosing Cleric. Again, you have those spells and that magic. And both of those are associated with her uh, god, uh, Aten. And again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. So if I'm not, I apologize uh, profusely in my very Midwestern self-deprecating way. I appreciate that. <laughs> but, you know, that, that light cleric goes very well with it because the light cleric is going to use the power of light to sure. be able to push back their enemies. The sun god stuff is so much fun to read about and to think about too. Just to think and like that, ex you can see it when you, when you look at it in like different religions too, there's a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's it makes sense to do cleric and warlock in their, in different ways, right? Like, yeah. But I mean, if you if you look through uh, theology, there is a lot about light versus dark, and mm -hmm. and and um, looking towards the light, and also in a lot of the symbolism uses light and the sun and things like that. So it it really is fascinating how um, just from a purely analytical standpoint how human society has worshipped light and, and in their understanding of light. Um, today, there isn't as much worship around light, but there kind of is where mm -hmm. people uh, just feel better and, and, and want to be out more when there is the sun a lot more use of sun lamps and things like that because that is life-giving. So it just mm -hmm. makes so much sense. It makes uh, a lot of sense. It makes a ton of sense about how people look towards that light. Um, I, uh, I looked towards the light first. I wanted to I wanted to maybe make her a light cleric. Um, and I I guess I I guess I sort of honed in more on the cult leader aspect of it and like what would a cult leader need in order to be successful probably charisma skills oh, well, yeah. okay well let's look at okay well let's look at different charisma based classes uh and how would they fit in a party too um so i i've made a lot of sorcerers already and I haven't made as many warlocks. Yeah. So, um, so I thought I'd give her a try. And it seems like I, I was as I was sending this off to as I was sending this off to you, mm -hmm. I was going like, man, she looks insane. I would badly want to play her. 
I would, I would want to play that character. I would want to play that character so much. Um, but comparing the uh, comparing the two, uh, like wisdom versus or wisdom and in, and including charisma, uh, just them. I, I I read a little bit into those uh, like role playing those aspects for lack of a better term too. Um, because again, actor, it's a game yes. <laughs> where you get to play as these characters. So, yeah. uh, but it seems like a slight, not every, I also like that. Yes. Everything, uh, a, a lot of stuff about humanity and how we have worshiped involves light. Not everything that is dark is evil, and not True. everything that is light is good. Yes. Right? So, like a slightly sinister cast to a character with even with a clear celestial influence, I thought would be fun to, you know, pick at. Well, for her, um, for her languages, when I was choosing her languages, I did choose celestial and infernal because she would need to be able to speak to both of those sides and um it kind of reminds me of that uh movie uh i think it's called legend i think that's the one i'm thinking of with Tom Cruise, where the uh character he says you cannot have light without dark and and also that's explored in and uh the dark crystal where mm -hmm. those creatures separated themselves from their light and their dark. I cannot remember the name of the creatures. And I feel the ashamed. And the mystics. Right, but what were they when they were together? What were they called? The, ooh, uh, it started with an U, I think. Right. The U. I, 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 I used to have the book. I love the movie. And when they- Pop came, it in the comments, y'all. Yeah, <laughs> pop it in. <laughs> um, they tried to separate their light and their dark and then it wound up trying to kill them and destroy everything so mm -hmm. um i i understand that there are religions where they say this is the light this is the dark uh, avoid the dark uh, and i'm probably going to get yelled at by a few people that dark is a part of you and so separating it out trying to cut it out of you is not going to solve your problem you have to identify what is that dark in you why is it in you and is that dark sinister or is it just a part of you that says something like yes when someone is insulting me i should turn the other cheek mm -hmm. however if someone is trying to physically hurt you you have the right as just a human being to fight back against that but we're told that that fight back is dark is it though or is it just something that is protecting you is it a yeah. part of yourself I, I was just talking to someone earlier today where i said that there's a theory that the reason why humans like the smell of fresh cut grass is a part of our primitive hunter side because that smell meant there were animals grazing nearby. So is that a remnant from our hunter predator side? Sure. Uh, so that kind of thing, or like when people were saying that sharks were evil, no, they're a very excellent predator that yeah. had honed their skills over millennia century millennia yeah millions of yes years. like there's yeah like just how, and just how perfect they are now too yes. like how many versions of other sharks like <laughs> didn't evolve to be didn't develop to, or like they like you should have seen the earlier versions of it the earlier versions of sharks looks like some kid was like oh i think this looks like a shark <laughs> It, it was like their their teeth were on the outside and it was like rolled it, it was so weird it was so weird perhaps not a beneficial mutation 
Right, right. Yeah. It ain't exactly opposable thumbs, you know. Right. It's not it's not these. It is definitely not these. But getting back to it, it's I'm not I'm not saying go into your dark side, Luke. Uh, what I am saying is that these are discussions, conversations that humanity has had all throughout the time of history that we know. Yeah. What is your light? What is your dark? Is your dark truly evil? Uh, is your light truly good? That kind of thing. Could I suggest something as well? Yeah. Um, the, the, our myths, our heroic myths. Think about your stereotypical masculine coded myths, right? Yes. The, war, the, the male warrior of light who banishes and faces the darkness and slays it. Uh, whereas your where uh, a myth like Persephone, where she goes to the to the, she confronts the darkness and she comes back out richer for it, yeah. right? Um, that is so interesting to me that uh, as a maybe a metaphor for maybe some kind of metaphor too for like artistic expression as well because. Um, Conflict breeds in, in drama. Conflict is the essence of drama. Yeah. There aren't that many good plays about people being nice to each other all the time. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you don't see it. Or you, if you do see it, uh, it, it, they don't, it doesn't last very long. No. <laughs> like, part of not, not banishing your darkness, but confronting it and understanding Understanding that, yeah, maybe um, could help you integrate it into yourself. Maybe exactly, um, uh, exactly. Well, I'm in a mood. I know we <laughs> went we went deep on this one. We really did we went deep on this. So, so we'll say to everyone, uh, we hope that you enjoyed our Nefertiti builds. Uh, we do have a Patreon account right now. So mm -hmm. you can find all of our builds on the Patreon account. And we would like it if you could support us uh, in this endeavor. We are modifying our program to make it more enjoyable uh, for everyone. So let us know if there's a particular uh, historical figure or politician you would like us to do a build on. We are very Midwestern, so we'll probably do it. Uh, <laughs> and also, if you could, please support us on our Patreon account. Uh, and also, don't forget to click like, uh, subscribe, and uh, we'll see you all next week. Have a good one. Say good night, Nate. Good night, Nate. Thank you for joining us on another episode of So You Want to Lead a Party. Please click the subscribe button, the like button, and don't forget to ring the bell. And if you enjoyed this week's episode, check out last week's video or the YouTube suggested videos.